You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I am Carlos Noche and I'm joined by my podcast partner, Lisa Schneer. Say hi, Lisa. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show today. All right, folks. Today, we're talking about the importance of partners and building your channel community, plus the power of investing in your employees' ability to build their own relationships. And to help us out with this topic today, we have someone who's an expert in this space, Drew Siegchrist, who was an early part of the team that grew Salesforce from $0 to over a billion in revenue. And during that time, he was both the number one sales manager globally and the number one account executive globally. Fantastic. He all also went on to have many other great experiences and in, is now the co-founder and CEO of his new startup, Connect the Dots. Drew, thank you for taking the time today and welcome to the show. Lisa and Carlos, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here with you. Awesome. All right, Drew, to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better, a little bit more at a personal level, what might be something that you're passionate about that those that may only know you through work may be surprised to know? Hmm. Um, well, those who know me through work uh, probably know this, I guess, uh, at least some of them. I, I'm learning Serbian. And, um, and I'm pretty passionate about it. Not everybody knows that, but, uh, but uh, our company is largely Serbian. And so I spend, uh, whenever I've got a free moment, I am working on an online uh, Serbian class. And, uh, and, I, and I've also mastered a, um, uh, a tongue twister in Serbian that, um, that most Serbians can't say. <laughs> and is Serbian a... I have no, I don't know nothing about it. So is it a very difficult language to learn or have you found it? Hey, no, it's kind of worked out. Uh, so grammatically, it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's one of the more difficult ones on the planet. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. There's, you know, elements. It's a, an Indo-European language. So you'll hear things that sound kind of, you know, based on like they sound like other European languages with a Latin root. But um, but the and the pronunciation is very crisp and clear. I actually really like that. But the grammar is crazy. Um, a noun changes form in every part of a sentence. So like wow. you know, Carlos, your name would change uh, eight different times based on uh, where it, uh, where your name is in a sentence. So you wow. have eight different versions of your name, and every noun you know has eight different versions of it. So like that's one of the things that's pretty complex about it. But um, but there's a lot that I like about it. And uh, I thought you guys were going to ask me if I could say the uh, tongue twister. No, I was no. going to go there next, but Carlos jumped <laughs> in with the question. And I was just like, okay, I guess awesome. we're moving on. <laughs> All right. I, I, I guess you want to know about the tongue twister. Right? <laughs> Come on, give right, it to right. us. All right. All right. So, well, since, it, since you insist, only because you insist, <laughs> um, it goes like this. It's chetri chapchicha na chunchichu chuchati tiochu. Wow. Okay. okay. I'm impressed. <laughs> should we ask right. what now, that means? Should, yeah. yeah you, you <laughs> or is that it's not clean? <laughs> no, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's suitable for all audiences, but it's a little weird. Um, it's, it basically means, uh, uh, it's like, uh, four blackbirds sitting on a stump chirping or something like that. It's roughly what it is. It's not something it comes up in everyday conversation very frequently, but <laughs> look if it does, over there. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm prepared. Hey, I'm prepared. look at that murder of crows over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. How about, uh, tell us a little about your story, Drew, you know, how'd you get to this point of success in your career? It's always a great way to kind of, I love hearing people's stories and their challenges through their, their uh, careers. Well, um, so, you know, Carlos, you and I, it looks like we have some similarities in our, in our stories and our early careers, uh, it started out in the early days of CRM for me. And, um, I, uh, so I, I went to a university in North Carolina and after, uh, graduating, uh, I had a couple of jobs in North Carolina, uh, one of which, uh, 
exposed me to the early days of CRM systems. And when I say the early days, I mean ACT. Do you remember ACT with the exclamation yeah. point? Um, so I implemented ACT for our small company and then I networked it, which is something that you know was kind of beyond what ACT was designed to do. So you we set up a server and we had multiple computers that were connecting to the same server. And uh, that kind of broke what ACT could do. We pushed it to its limits. And, but I got kind of fascinated with this idea of like, oh, this is really neat. We can manage all of our customer data in this database that we can all access. And so I, I started investigating better technologies for that. And the next thing I know, I, I ended up getting uh, hired into a company that implemented the next set of better technologies for, um, for mid-market companies. Um, and this is based out of North Carolina in the Southeast we had a, a bunch of mid-market companies and some larger ones like Volvo Trucking was one of our customers. And we implemented a, a product called Sales Logics for um, Volvo Trucking. And Carlos, you might remember that um, from the early days of CRM. And um, so Sales Logics was actually founded by the guy who created ACT. And it was designed to solve those problems. It was designed to make it uh, easier to network uh, your, uh, your you know, centralized database and have all the users accessing it. And uh, so we implemented that and I, I spent maybe a year and a half uh, at that company uh, working with these mid-market companies. And I realized, wow, there's still this big problem here in that um, it could network better than ACT could network into, you know, uh, as a product, but it still was not great. It was the world, or it was the days of client server computing. The database would corrupt. Um, people would have problems on their laptops. They would literally would FedEx their laptops to us. We'd fix their laptop and send it back out to them. And it was kind of a pain, you know, and it was a big, messy um, uh, solution. And we were getting paid to solve all the problems. So whenever the laptops would corrupt or the databases would fail or whatever, we got paid for that. So it was kind of part of our business model, but it wasn't fun. You know, it wasn't like we're, that wasn't the fun part of the business. So we, had, we were dabbling with the idea of starting to host some software uh, for, our, for our customers. And uh, just as that we were dabbling with that idea. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal. This is sometime in, in 1999. And uh, it was about the ASP industry, application service provider industry, which for those of us who are old enough to remember it, that, that was the term right before they coined the phrase on demand or later what became SaaS. And then ultimately it became you know, cloud computing. It was called ASP. And in that article in the Wall Street Journal about the ASP industry starting, uh, it referenced this guy named Mark Benioff, who was leaving Oracle, apparently with the blessing of Larry Ellison, the CEO of Oracle, and two, two million of Larry's dollars to go start this company called Salesforce.com. And in the article, he said he was going to rewrite CRM from the ground up to be deployed as a web application, an application that was, you know, you would all you do is launch a web page and voila, all your software would be inside that web page. And this was... I mean, now it's 2020, almost 2023, right? And that's not mind blowing at all. That's what we do at all, at all day, every day now. Everything's a SaaS application. But back then, boy, that was mind blowing. And I read it and I thought, this is going to be the future. And so um, I know that one of your favorite questions uh, during your podcast is, uh, tell me what's a, you know, a cold email tech tactic that will break through the noise and actually get to you. I don't know the answer to that question exactly. I got some theories, but... I sent a cold email to Mark Benioff and he actually read it and responded very quickly. And uh, the cold email was, Hey, hi, Mark read the article in the wall street journal. Awesome. Love what you're doing. Um, can we resell salesforce.com to our customers like Volvo trucking and all these other companies? And uh, he got back to me and said, we're not going to have a reseller channel. We're just going to have a direct sales team. And I said, I wrote back and I said, maybe we should talk about something else then. Like, uh, he said, come out to California, let's talk. And so nice. literally flew me out to California, met with Mark, and uh, he, he, inside of, honestly, it was like three minutes, he offered me a job. And, uh, and he quadrupled my salary uh, based on what I was making back in North Carolina, and it was kind of an easy no-brainer. I felt like I just got recruited up to the big leagues. Uh, I felt like I was way out of my depth, but I said yes. Went back to North Carolina, packed up all my stuff in a U-Haul, and then uh, drove it west and started to work for Salesforce.com as employee number 36. I was one of their first account executives, and that is the beginning of uh, really my, you know, my 
story as a professional and where I kind of got my big chance. Awesome. You, you needed that quadruple raise just to afford the rent in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I my quadrupled my, my income, but I think I, I cut my, my apartment size by, you know, by 75%. So it all... <laughs> It was, it was, I mean, 1999 was a tough time to move there. There was no real estate available. That was the dot-com boom, the height of it. It was, it was really hard to find an apartment and, uh, and everything was super, super expensive. So, but it still, you know, it was super exciting and, uh, definitely made the right call. I'd say. Awesome. I'd say it worked out all right for you, Drew. (laughs) (laughs) It worked out okay. So, so kind of taking the next step into uh, leading into what you're doing now, you talk a lot about relationship selling, and it sounds like I love that story about reaching out to Mark, and and, and that was built at the beginning of a beautiful relationship. When we talk about relationship selling, uh, as we segue into talking more about what you're doing with Connect the Dots, for our listeners, what is what is that like? What is the definition in your mind of relationship selling? Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, understanding first understanding what relationships you have, um, in your life, you know, who do you know, who do those people know, potentially even who do those, those people know, like how far out does this chain of relationships extend for you? So understanding that really the, the chain of relationships, I think that's, that's one thing. I think another thing is, um, adopting a mindset of pay it forward in life. In all things, and um, so I, I um, you know, I do. Have you read the Tipping Point, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell? I don't know if you guys. I haven't yet, but no. it's on the list. It's a great book. There's a, they they have these archetypes of, of people that um, play roles in when things become big breakout successes, big hits. Like why does somebody? I think one of the examples in the book is like, why, you know, why does somebody else, or why, why all of a sudden are hush puppy shoes popular again after many years of not being popular? And they break out all the people that play roles in making these things, you know, hit a tipping point and then grow really, really wildly. And uh, one of the archetypes is called a connector. And a connector is somebody who loves putting people together. Like, oh, you know, you've got a problem. I know somebody who's got a the, you know, perfect solution for you, or you should talk, or I know somebody who's been through the same type of thing, or I know somebody that you should really meet for whatever reason. And I just, I've kind of always had that default mindset, um, you know, just kind of my, I don't know, my entire adult life and going back even before that. Uh, and sometimes it can be annoying. You're constantly, you know, saying, hey, I want to connect you two for whatever reason. Not everybody wants it, but you got to, so, so there's nuance. You got to figure out how to make sure that you're, you're doing it in a, in a way that's respectful and value add for everybody. But um, I think you adopt a mindset that like, that you want to help people where you can and, um, and not in a transactional way. I think that that's pretty obvious. Like when you're helping people on in a transactional way, and that's the only time that you show up, I think that, uh, it feels kind of icky. Nobody likes that. And, um, and you know, people will know, you know, you get a reputation for time over time for doing that. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, step one is under, understand your network, understand the people in your network. Step, step number two is make sure that you've got this, this um, um, pay it forward mindset where you're going to help no matter, you know, no matter what, no matter where uh, you're going to, you're going to see how you can help pe- the people in your network. Um, and then, you know, I'd say the third thing is then when it comes time for you uh, to have an agenda and you want to, you know, let's, let's be, let's speak plainly here. If you're a salesperson and you've got something to sell, you know who you want to sell to typically have a target territory uh, or a list of accounts that you know are, is the right list of accounts. And then, you know, the titles at those companies that you want to sell to. Then, um, you know, step number one, absolutely. If, if you're selling, if you're in a B2B sales organization, and you're selling something with a high enough value. Step number one should be understand your network and then tap into it. Make the right asks. And, you know, if you've, done, if you've lived a virtuous life, if you've been a good person paying it forward, then you can tap into that network and people are going to want to help you. And, um, so I think, uh, you know, that's, that's how I think about relationship selling, um, and, uh, at a very high level. And we can go into all the details about, you know, uh, how to make that actionable. Okay. 
Okay, because I, I want to throw you a little bit of a cur- curveball right off the bat here. Um, I work a lot with SDR, BDR teams who are building networks relationships for the first time. And oftentimes, uh, a lot of people that they're reaching out to now, especially now with, with the influx of the kind of connections that people get on LinkedIn, a lot of them are immediately suspicious of someone who they don't know that's trying to build a relationship with them. Um, how, how do you get around that? What's your thought on, on how do you get started? Yeah, I think um, I actually have, I have, I have a very clear thought on this. Um, when, when I started out at Salesforce, I was 26 years old. And we actually, I don't think we actually had a role, the BDR, or the SDR role yet, but we had to do it ourselves. We didn't have a, you know, there were only 36 people in the company and the account executives there had to do all their own prospecting. Uh, they had to respond to the inbound leads. They had to do the outbound stuff. Um, and the reality is that senior executives don't really want to talk to an SDR or BDR. It's, you know, it's just the truth. You know, they're not that. You know, now, now SDRs and BDRs can do some stuff um, to put themselves in a better position. They can become truly experts in the problem that they solve for the people that they're selling to. Uh, they can become truly experts in the technologies or the solutions that they that their company brings. Um, they can become experts in those things, and then gradually they can start to earn that. Uh, but I think in the very early days, what I would say is borrow status else from from other people, because mm-hmm. um, you know an SDR. If I get an email and I get you know I'm, I'm now CEO of a company and uh, we have budget to spend on things and we got problems that need to be solved, and I delete almost every SDR email I get. It's just it's just noise. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry, SDRs. I feel your pain. I've been there. I've done it. But it's just noise. And, um, you know, there there are every once in a while, I would say it's probably like one in 300 SDR emails. There's something that just stands out in a way that I might reply to. But, you know, call it 299 out of 300 times I'm hitting the delete button. I'm just like, oh, this is a tax on my time today. Um, but if I get an email from a CEO, Okay, I'm curious. If I get an email with a, you know from a senior executive at some company, then there's a slightly higher chance that I'm you know gonna not delete it. I'll read it and see what they have to say. Um, uh, if I get an email from somebody I know, I read it 100% of the time. I I mean I never delete something from somebody that I know. And uh, so there you go. That's the binary switch right there. Um, so if you're an SDR, um, num- borrow status. You don't have or a BDR. You- Borrow status. You don't have it yet. You'll, you'll learn it. Someday you will have it. And it's okay. But when you're starting out, and I did this at Salesforce, I learned this, you know, with, working with Mark Benioff and the rest of our executive team. I drafted, nobody wants to see an email from Drew Seacrest when he's 26 years old. But getting an email from Mark Benioff, CEO of Salesforce, who was a direct report of Larry Ellison at Oracle and, you know, was in the media and all this stuff, that got through the noise, even if the person didn't know who Mark Benioff was, or, you know, even if they didn't know Mark Benioff personally. So I did a lot of what I call, um, uh, you know, wizard behind the curtain uh, stuff uh, at Salesforce, where I would draft emails from Mark Benioff to send to whoever I wanted him to send it to. And if Mark, if it was a cold email from Mark, but it was from Mark and he had the CEO title, great. If it was, if it was a warm email from Mark and Mark actually knew that person, well, then it was golden. You know, we were going to get a reply. We were going to get a meeting. Um, but again, uh, you have to think about how to borrow the status. So when I, we were small enough at that point that I could say, hey, Mark, I want you to send this email to this, uh, this executive at this company. And I would draft it for Mark and I would spend a lot mm-hmm. of time to do it right. I'd write in Mark's voice. I, I, Mark never used to capitalize anything when he typed. Hmm. Right? So, you know, so I would do that. You know, I might mimicked everything Mark would do. I learned, I read enough of his emails. I, I was like, you know, GPT chat for Mark. Yeah. Off. I could, <laughs> you could tell, yeah. me what the, tell me what, what the target was and I could type it out and nobody could tell it was, wasn't from Mark. So then Mark got comfortable that I would do that for him correctly. And I would send it to him in all lowercase, just like he would. And then he would just copy and paste it and send it to the person that I asked him to send it to. And um, that would get a meeting. Now the Mark, Ideally, what he would love to do is, is you know, get the meeting and have it immediately transferred to Drew Sechrist, junior account executive. That way, Mark frees up his time and he can go on with, you know, um, busy CEO stuff or swimming with dolphins in Hawaii or whatever he was up to at that point. <laughs> and um, but but you can't always do that. You can't do it right away. 
right? So there's like uh, gradually, Mark could turn me into a more senior executive, and then he then I could start doing some of this stuff. But in the early days, Mark would have to take the first meeting, and that's so, what we do. The oh, so Drew does cut you off. So he, so he would have that initial at least the initial call, if not maybe a couple others to kind of get it going, and then yes. you know can then kind of hand it off after that. That's right. And, you know, later as we started, you know, we're 36 people in the company, really small. There aren't a lot of us to hand things off to. But as we got a little bit bigger and we hired in some more senior execs, then he could hand it off to like my boss, Carl Schachter, who had a VP title. And, you know, and Carl had enough of a, you know, enough gravitas that he could do that. So then Mark could maybe get out of even having the first call. Right. And then, and then it would be Carl and, and then Drew. And then it's kind of like a, I don't know. It's like a, 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 it's like pledging a fraternity, which I'm not a fraternity. I wasn't a fraternity guy, but you know, like the, whoever's at the bottom of the uh, bottom rung has to do the, you know, the grunt work basically. So, you know, Mark does the glory work. He would you know send out the email that I would ask him to send. Then he would set up the meeting and in inviting Carl Schachter, my VP. And then Carl would have the meeting and he of course would bring me. And then I'd be the grunt who was the scribe, you know, writing down all the notes from the meeting, taking the action items, figuring out what needed to be done next. And then at the end of that call, then I would go run the sales cycle. I'd, I would be introduced and Carl would say, this is Drew. He's your account executive. He's going to work with your team to go figure out how to, um, you know, make these, uh, uh, how to uh, determine if there's a good opportunity for us at salesforce.com to help you with your problem. So we'll come back in three weeks after they've worked with your team to do the due diligence and they'll present their findings and you can make a decision if you'd like to go forward with us or not. And that's what would happen. So, and then by, you know, I earned my stripes by doing that over and over and over again and doing it well and selling a lot of deals that way. Um, and, you know, so gradually then I became somebody who had a network and was known and gradually I got a nicer title and it was something that, you know, I could start leading these things. And then I taught my team to do this. And then we did that over and over again. And that's, uh, so that's, um, I think that's a great way to do relationship selling right. So figure out if you're if you're junior, figure out who's got lots of power around you, who's got lots of network around you that you can tap into, tap into it, have zero ego about yourself. You don't even exist. You're the you're the wizard behind the curtains. Uh, your name doesn't even have to pop up. Maybe even ever if you're an SDR or BDR, maybe you don't even have your name never has to appear at all. You're just a you're pulling the strings behind behind the scenes and you're you know telling each person on your team what they're supposed to say at the right time you orchestrate the whole thing the deal comes together you get the credit um, and that's what you really want uh, and then over time you become a more senior executive and you're the person you let you let your team pull your strings and you know puppet you and and uh, and that's how you grow awesome well Drew, you know today a lot of people talk about authenticity in the way they act with others and the way they communicate to folks. How does that kind of come into play as you think about building relationships and even using your products today? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think all of us have an innate, you know, authenticity sensor. Um, so you, you can, you can feel it if somebody's, uh, being really authentic with you or somebody's got some other agenda. Um, and, and I just think about that. I think about the people that I'm kind of like the most, my closest friends though. And, and I'll put my sister in this camp. You know, my sister's like one of the most authentic people that I know. She can't be inauthentic. It's just, she was, she wouldn't even know how, if you said, Hey, be inauthentic in some way. She'd it would fry her circuits. Um, so I think we all sense it. We all feel it. Um, now, so, you got to, you just got to be that if you're, you know, or, or uh, you just got to be that. Um, that's number one. Number two is when you are a salesperson, you have an agenda. And, you know, so how do you, how do you balance the two? And, um, and I think, you know, I'll reference this earlier. Like, I think in your life, you know, come with the pay it for it ad attitude, omnidirectional pay it for it attitude. Cause then you're kind of covering your bases. I just, yeah, be completely honest here. You're covering your bases, like you've been a nice person to everybody. And so when it comes time for you to ask for a favor that is your agenda, then they're receptive to it. 
because they know that that's not all there is to you. There is that part of you, right? And uh, but you know they're they're open to it. The other thing I would say is you know do not sell anything you do not believe in. Right. If you if you're selling if you find yourself selling something you don't believe in right now, then get out immediately. <laughs> mm-hmm. Tend to your resignation right now. Because if you're not solving problems for people and you don't believe that this is really going to make their lives better, then it's then you're going to find yourself in a very inauthentic position. And uh, and I you know you hear about these things. Boiler room, you know, boiler room is a movie about that situation. Don't, don't do that to yourself. Right. Um, that's that's like that, that will rot your soul. I just said that to a workshop this this past week. I was like, if you aren't genuinely passionate about what you're selling and enthusiastic and you don't genuinely believe that it can help the people you're calling, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be able to tell. Yeah, it, and, you, and you tell. Like, you're, this is your life. You know, the biggest chunk of time that you spend when you're awake in your working years is working. And uh, so, you know, make sure that you're doing something that you feel really, really good about that. You know, I, I, I've been lucky enough that starting with Salesforce, I basically have everything I've done since for Salesforce and ever since I would have done it for free. You know, I loved it so much. It was so fun. I love the problems that we were solving. I really love the problems that, sol- that Salesforce is solving in the early 2000s. It was just really, really fun because I'd experienced the other side of that. I knew we were solving a really hard problem for people, a really messy problem and making their lives better. It was, it was a joy. So whenever I, you know, whenever I would leverage my network and say, Hey, you know, I, I know that, you know, the CEO of that company over there, they should be using this. And, um, you know, but it's going to be hard for me to get his or her attention. You know, that person, could you please make the introduction? I guarantee you, they're going to thank you in the end. And I'll thank you too, because we'll both win. Yeah. Yeah, the um, you know we talk about if if you think about your job as selling something to someone, let's be honest, nobody out there wants to be sold, but everybody loves to buy. So if your approach is really, hey, we have an amazing product that solves really tough, difficult problems, we're here to help, and that's the reason of that initial communication or communications out to them. It really changes your mindset, which is really important in building a real authentic relationship to start with. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's perspective and mindset's really critical in everything you do. So I, I agree with you a thousand percent. Um, hey, in your product, before the podcast, talk a little bit about relationship mapping. W- walk me through that. What's, you know, what does that mean? And what are some of the elements to make that effective? Sure. Uh, and, and you're talking about specifically for Connect the Dots, the product that yeah, uh, yeah, our, com- our company. You makes. said it was a good product, so I'm waiting to hear it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm very happy to talk about it. So um, we, uh, um, okay, so the going back to the early days of Salesforce, the hardest part of everything I just told you about, um, about leveraging these relationships, was figuring out who really knew who. And so just a little history lesson here. Salesforce was founded in 1999. That's the year I started. Um, and then LinkedIn came along a few years later. I, I don't remember exactly what. We'll call it 20, 20, 2002, 2003 or something. And uh, there were a lot of companies out there that were kind of doing you know, business social graphs. So it wasn't clear that LinkedIn was going to be the thing that it, became, that it ultimately became later. But in the early 2000s, there was nothing. And so what we would do is blast an email out in the company and say, hey, I'm trying to sell to Cisco. Does anybody know anybody at Cisco? And people would say, oh, I, you know, my friend, or my neighbor, or you know, my biking buddy, or my cousin, or whatever works there and does this. I, you know, I can make an introduction. And that was okay until we had a, maybe a couple of hundred employees. And then after that, if you start, if you keep doing that, it turns into insanity. And then co- eventually, the company shuts it down. And says, sorry guys, can't do it anymore. You cannot blast emails out like that, which is really sad because that was really nice and very useful for us. Um, then LinkedIn came along and it gradually LinkedIn got large enough that it was useful, but it didn't get too large that it became less useful because there was, a, there was kind of this, uh, happy, you know, golden period of LinkedIn when everybody on there was actually, you know, they knew each other. You could, you know, if you were linked into somebody, it, it meant, meant you really probably had met in person. That, that's kind of what the rules of the, the network were. People seemed to abide by it. And it was also just a smaller network. 
So if you could see that somebody was net, net connected to somebody else, then great. Okay, leverage that relationship. I can say, oh, I'm trying to get to Cisco, and I see my colleague, you know, my VP of finance here at our company knows that somebody over there that we want to get to. Great. Fast forward to now, you know, 2022, 20, almost 2023, and now the LinkedIn graph is going crazy. Um, so you know, everybody is connected. Everybody, it, it's it is a fabulous um, platform for getting for blasting out your message to a large audience. And so people have aggregated lots of followers, lots of connections, and it, what has that the, the sacrifice to that, the, the the wild wild success of that, comes at a cost, and the cost is you don't really know who knows who on LinkedIn anymore. So there's a lot of false positives. There's there's signal in there, but there's way more noise than there is signal. And so um, our product is to solve this problem. You know, if I could figure out who Mark Benioff knew in the early days. Boy, I got a deal. I had a deal, right? Like I could get an opportunity, I could get a meeting, I could we could run the sales process, we could close the deal. And then we gradually hired in some other executives that had good networks too. You know, like uh, Jim Steele came along later. And he came from IBM, kind of a different parallel universe. He had a great network. We, if I could figure out who he knew, I mean, literally figure out who he knew, and then we could go close million dollar deals just based on the strength of his relationships. The problem was I didn't know everybody he knew. And he had a really big, net, he had a whole, you know, like this invisible network of people that if I had only known everybody, boy, I, I mean, I was always, I was the number one account executive there, but I could have been, you know, number one by a wider margin, you know, if I could just tap into all of those relationships. So that's the problem that we are solving with Connect the Dots. And so Connect the Dots, really simply, what we do is we let you um, aggregate uh, uh, all of your, not only your LinkedIn contacts, but all of your contacts that you've ever communicated with across any of your email accounts uh, that you have access to um, by, by applying AI to the header data of every email that you've ever sent or received in your life. And in that header data, that's the from, the to, the CC fields, and the date field. From that, we're able to extract everybody that you've ever communicated with and, uh, and then build you a complete list of, uh, of all those people it's all indexed and searchable and really neatly organized by their name, by their title, by their company, by their location, and also by their old companies too. So you can see, um, you know, I can search across that entire set of data and find the people that, you know, all the chief technology officers that I know that I might have, you know, maybe I emailed with somebody 15 years ago when they were at eBay and now they are, it's today they're at Amazon and they're the CTO of Amazon. You know, I might not have had any idea that that's the career path that they took and we were never on LinkedIn or any of that stuff, but we emailed a bunch 15 years ago when they were at eBay. All that is surfaced and organized neatly and it's completely searchable for me. And the cool thing is um, because every relationship is actual interaction between people, as opposed to like LinkedIn is binary. LinkedIn is I'm either connected to you on LinkedIn or I'm not. And, uh, and so, for example, I, I, you, I don't think we are, any of us are connected on LinkedIn, but we've not emailed. yet. Yeah. And we'll probably, we'll probably connect on LinkedIn. I'd love <laughs> to do that. Um, but we have emailed. And so there's a relationship history there. And it's, we can actually calculate how well we know each other based on that. And it's weak at this point because we, you know, we haven't emailed very much, but over time that graduates up and, and that's what connect.ops does. It shows me who are the people that I really know and how well I know them. So there's a simple three dots that indicates that inside of our product, one dot to a weak relationship. And we also equate a, a LinkedIn connection to a weak relationship. And then if we've communicated more than that, then two dots is a familiar relationship. And then three dots is a strong relationship. So it's really simple. I can see across my 26,000 contacts, how well I know all of them and where they are now, what their titles are. And, you know, and I can, I can leverage because I've, I've been a pretty good person. I think my mom says so. <laughs> and, and I paid it forward. I can reach out to any of them and and pick up where we left off. And I've got the context about that for all twenty six thousand. Now that's awesome, and in and of itself, that's you know that is a great way to do relationship selling to understand your relationship. But that is just the tiniest, tiniest tip of the iceberg. So where this gets really interesting is you can turn on connect the dots for your company. And you can also, so everybody in the company gets a connected dots account. Everybody becomes a connector for everybody else. So you can see each other's uh, networks. This is where it grows exponentially. 
So where I've, whereas I've got 26,000 contacts that I can find through my network, I have, uh, <clears throat> I've, we've turned it on for our company and anybody else in the world who's got a Connect the Dots account. Connect the Dots is free. You can have an individual account and keep it for life. And then you're able to plug that into your work email account and your personal email account and your LinkedIn. And then when you leave your company, you unplug it from your work account, but you harvest all of your contacts. And then you go to your next company and then you plug in your new work account and then you harvest all your contacts there. So this is your relationship bank for life. So everybody who's got an account that I know on Connect the Dots, I, it, they, they can turn this off. They can control it. But by default, we're sharing visibility to each other's networks. So I can see 26,000 of my own contacts, but I can now see just under a million what we call potential contacts. Those are second degree contacts. And I can see who really knows whom. So if I had had this back 20 years ago when I was working with Mark Benioff, then I could have seen exactly who Mark knows across all of these companies and who he knows really well. And I could see the same thing with my, you know, Jim Steele and I, with Frank Van Bienendahl and Susan St. Ledger and Carl Schachter and all the other executives in our company at the time, because man, they had really, really good networks. But I know that I only tapped a tiny, tiny percentage of their, their networks. And that is the problem that we're solving now. And um, so I, hopefully that has explained it. That's great. And and I, I will jump in with the, one of the first things that came to mind. So Drew, how are you tackling um, ma- remaining uh, data compliant in, with all the data privacy laws? Because obviously you're opting in to share your network. That's fine. The people in your network have not opted in to be a part of the network, the, the larger network. So how, how are you getting making sure that everything stays compliant? Sure. So we are GDPR, CCPA compliant. Um, we uh by the way, I'll give a little shout out. We use Vanta to help us with some of that. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with that product, but they do mm-hmm. help us uh, help us do that. Um, each user is the maximum that anybody is ever sharing on Connect the Dots. The maximum you can share is um, the name of a person, uh, their title, their company, and then these three dots that indicate how well you know them. That's it. You're not sharing their email address. You're not sharing their phone number. You're not sharing the last time you communicated with them or any of your communication history. It's basically just who's this person and how well do you know them? That's it. And um, so it's very innocuous information. You're not sharing. There are plenty of other companies out there like, you know, like Zoom Info that's actually, you know, taking these phone numbers and and email addresses and stuff like that and selling you that, Um, you know, they, they will sell you that data. And by the way, lots of people find that incredibly useful, and it is, um, but that's not our business. We don't do that ever, uh, and we'll never do that. Okay, fantastic. I love that. So they really have to go through you in order to get to your network. And it, like the, with that lack of visibility, you are the gateway to uh, all of your connections. Uh, I'm so glad you teased that out, Lisa, because that's exactly right. We think So the point is, like, let's say I'm an SDR, or I'm Drew Seacrest back in, you know, in, in 1999. And if I send an email directly to a person that Mark Benioff knows, probably going to get deleted, you know, if I don't know the person. But if Mark sends the email, then it's going to get read and it's going to be replied to. We're basically just enforcing that. Like, that is the right thing to do. I don't want another email from an SDR that I don't know. Sorry, SDRs. I love you all. And I know that you got a hard job out there. But it's time to upgrade your skill set. You know, become the wizard behind the curtain. Don't be the spam machine, turn into the wizard behind the curtain that's pulling the strings, and then have the people who actually have those relationships communicate with each other. You can do all of the orchestration of it, um, but if you really want it to work, it's got to be between two people who already know each other and have a relationship. So and I really for everybody like... else out there... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Carly. No, head you. Sorry, let me cut you off. Oh, I was just going to say, don't worry. If you're, you, if I'm speaking to the young SDRs and the young BDRs out there. Don't worry, you will build your network over time. And over time, you will graduate into, you'll have the gravitas that people want to, you know, they'll know who you are. They're going to want to read your email someday. It's just not yet. <laughs> well, the one thing in your statement that I really like about it, which I, th- I think it, it gets to this is, uh, I'm not getting any younger. So it, I don't have that photographic memory. You, you know how it goes. We travel the world. We meet thousands of people. Uh, you know, I get sometimes I go to an SKO and I go, "Hey, Carlos, I'm sure you don't remember me." And I'm thinking, "You were you did my workshop last year." I'm thinking to myself, "I talked to over a thousand people last year. 
but I don't want to say that to him, right? And the reason I'm bringing this up is, I mean, so many of us, I think, even though we may link into someone on LinkedIn, we forget about our network. Kind of like your statement earlier. Hey, I knew this guy 12, 15 years ago. He's now the CIO somewhere. If someone could just help me see that connection, now it's created a whole reason to have a call versus how in the world do I know this person or not even recognizing it? So I thought that was a great point. Yeah. And it's, it's super, everybody has this very awkward feeling when you know you should know somebody, but you don't know how you know them. And then you just want to go run for the hills, right? You're like, oh, I just can't <laughs> bear to have the first minute of this conversation with this person because it's going to be so awkward. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or and, I'm uh, fake so, it, so, faking my way through it. <laughs> yeah. And I, and so for, you know, my 26,000 contacts, I've got, I've got context on all of them. I know exactly where you're like, where we left off. And uh, so yeah. it, it's, it's pretty amazing. One thing I didn't tell you is uh, we have a Chrome extension that uh, mm. sits on top of LinkedIn, on top of Sales Navigator. It also sits on top of Salesforce and on top of Gmail. And we're going to expand it to other locations too. So you can imagine you're looking at a LinkedIn profile for somebody like, do I know this person? And then you just look at the Chrome extension, click, and it'll pop open. And you'll, be like, you'll see every email you've ever had with that person across all their email addresses going back to the beginning of time. Context. That's amazing. That sounds very powerful, Drew. It's really exciting. Let's change direction a little bit here because we teased it out a few times through throughout the, the conversation. So when you mentioned that the 299 cold emails from SDRs you'll delete, but there might be one. Can you help them to our, yes, okay, I understand, overarching messages, use the, the credibility you've got at your fingertips, try to build off that. Um, however, when that one cold email, uh, you know, tweaks your interest, what is it that, that they do differently? Um, okay, if you can reference somebody I know, um, great. That, you know, somebody I know well, okay. You, it's going to, it'll spark something in my brain and I'll continue reading a little bit further. Um, if you, sp if you reference companies that are super relevant to me, like maybe competitors, you know, or like, you know, really tightly aligned uh, in some way, shape or form um, that, that could break through. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not impossible to look from the outside at a company and say, I know that this company has a certain problem that they need to solve and it's uh and it's a high priority for them so if you happen to guess what's in my brain at that moment and that might, might be the one in 300 times like you know uh, uh like for example we're hiring for devops right now and devops is a pretty pretty hard thing to hire for right now if you want to you know get great quality uh and so if an sdr sent me something that referenced you know hey we have a we have an amazing set of DevOps uh, candidates, you know, that fit your whatever criteria. I would reply to that right now because that happens <laughs> to be very top of mind for, for me. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I, I'm not sure that you could find that out. I'm not sure how you would find that right now. You might be able to find that. You might be able to look on our website. Maybe we, you know, it's posted there or something like that. Uh, so those are, those are some of the key thoughts that occur to me. Fair enough. Awesome. All right. Here's our uh, last big question for you. We call it Acceleration Insights. Drew, it's your chance to give our listeners that one piece of advice that might help them achieve their goals this year. Well, I would say uh, we're going into 2023. It looks like a pretty, if you're selling technology, this is going to be a hard year, everybody. So buckle up, get ready. Um, cold outreach techniques are not the way to go. Uh, they're already hard in the best of times when you're selling into a really good market. When the market takes a nosedive, everybody's going to have a flight to trust. Uh, they're going to delete all those cold emails. So number one piece of advice is go to ctd.ai, uh, sign up for your, your own free connect the dots account, and then, uh, and then lobby, get your company on it, get everybody in the company on it, uh, light up your corporate network, Invite all your uh, all your investors, advisors, partners, friends, so that you can expand your network, and then t be the wizard behind the curtains, pull the strings, and uh, and then you know get in front of all of your prospects, uh, leveraging warm relationships. So that would be my number one piece of advice for 2023. 
Perfect. Be, be the puppet master, folks. <laughs> Drew, if, uh, if any of our listeners were interested in speaking to you more on any of the topics we covered today, what, what is your preferred method of communication? Is it through the website or LinkedIn or... I'm a classic email guy, as maybe you guess. Okay. Right? <laughs> so I, the, the best way to reach out to me is uh, send an email to drew at ctd.ai, ctd.ai. And um, if you reference that uh, you heard me on the B2B Revenue Excellence Experience podcast uh, and you're interested in setting up an account, uh, let me know that. I will send you a link that lets you skip the wait list. Ooh, there you go. Hot tip, folks. Drew, cannot thank you enough for your time today. And, and thank you so much for being on the show. Lisa, Carlos, it was a real, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. All right, every. All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share this episode with your friends, your family, your network, your kids, get them off screens for a little bit. And if they like what they hear, and if you like what you hear, please do us a favor and throw us a five-star review on iTunes. I am Lisa Schneer. I'm joined by my pa partner in crime, Carlos Noche. And until next time, we wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.